All right, we're going to continue our reading of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. And uh, remember in chapter one, a man stood in line, got onto a bus. The bus took off, literally took off into the sky. And that's where we left off. So chapter two, I was not left very long at the mercy of the tussle-haired poet because another passenger interrupted our conversation. But before that happened, I had learned a great deal about him. He appeared to be a singularly ill-used man. His parents had never appreciated him, and none of the five schools at which he had been educated seemed to have made any provision for a talent and temperament such as his. To make matters worse, he had been exactly the sort of boy in whose case the examination system works out with a maximum unfairness and absurdity. It was not until he reached the university that he began to, rec to uh, recognize that all these injustices did not come by chance, but were inevitable. They were inevitable results of our economic system. Capitalism did not merely enslave the workers. It also ruined the taste and vulgarized intellect. Hence our education's educational system and hence the lack of recognition for new genius. This discovery had made him a communist, but when the war came along and he saw Russia in alliance with the capitalist governments, he had found himself once more isolated and had to become a conscientious objector. The indignities he suffered at this stage of his career had, he confessed, embittered him. He decided that he would serve the cause best by going to America. But then America came into the war too, and it was at this point that he suddenly saw Sweden as the home of a really new and radical art, but the various oppressors had given him no facilities for going to Sweden. And there were money troubles. His father, who had never progressed beyond the most atrocious mental complacency and smugness of the Victorian epic, was giving him a ludic ludicrously inadequate allowance. And he had been very badly treated by a girl, too. He had thought her a rather civilized and adult personality, and then she had unexpectedly revealed that she was a mass of bourgeois prejudices and monogamatic instincts. Jealousy, possessiveness was a quality he particularly disliked. She had even shown herself at the end to be mean about money. And that was the last straw. He had jumped under a train. I gave a start, but he took no notice. Even then he continued. Ill luck had continued to dog him. He had been sent to the gray town, but of course it was a mistake. I would find, he assured me, that all the other passengers would be with me on the return journey. But he would not. He was going to stay there. And he felt quite certain that he was going where, at last, his finally, finally critical spirit would no longer be outraged by an uncongenial environment where he would find recognition and appreciation. Meanwhile, since I hadn't got my glasses, he would read me the passage from which Cyril Bolello had been so insensitive. And that's where we're going to pause today.